Okay, in this video, which is probably medium length, we are going to meet Lamarck. Now, I have a very soft place in my heart for Lamarck because um, there are a lot of things I really like about this guy's story. So um, he was at a he was a professor at a very famous French institute, and I cannot speak French, so I mingle it and I cannot say it but he's part of this institute. And by the time he becomes chair, which he does, he is so excited about it that he says that he is the chair of invertebrates and earthworms. And that cracks me up because clearly earthworms are invertebrates and clearly Lamarck knew that, but he just loved earthworms so much that he had to put that on the title anyway. So here's Lamarck, and he's at this, like I said, very famous French um, university. And the he is the way that universities worked then. It wasn't that students enrolled for particular classes, clues, uh, for particular semesters of classes that are united. Um, they had to take, they had to go to like classrooms and sit in classroom hours. And Lamarck. And so what would happen is students would pay per class. So like if you, if we were in a classroom, which we would normally be, and you were walking into my classroom, you would stick, put like $5 in my tip jar. And everybody who came in would have to put $5 in the tip jar. And that's how I got my salary. And so you can see it's kind of a popularity contest, right? So Lamarck was super, super popular. The students loved him. And so he quickly became um, he quickly became, the, the, he quickly rose to the top. And he was really, um, he was so good at critical thinking and for seeing the world around him and for formulating hypotheses about things that must be true, that he was really well regarded, not just amongst his students, but amongst his peers. And he's working at around the same, at the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s. Here, I got a slide that says that. And he's working at the same time that Napoleon is wreaking holy hell across Europe. Now, of course, Napoleon is French. And before Napoleon had his huge fall, he was rising, he had his meteoric rise to the top. And one of the things that he did is he would bring people with him on his um, on his ventures, and both physically he would bring them with him with him and um, intellectually. And so he liked to surround himself. Napoleon liked to surround himself with the best people, and one of the people that he surrounded himself with was Lamarck. And so Lamarck was one of the first Europeans to see giraffes. And there's a whole so story, some kind of a sad story about Lamarck and giraffes. It's kind of a famous story. Um, and I'll, get, I'll circle back to the giraffes, but let me go on about what this meant for Lamarck. So Lamarck got to go to Egypt and <clears throat> across um, the Eastern side of um, Africa and he got to be Napoleon's naturalist, Napoleon's biologist, which was great. Um, and in fact, because of that, his rank in the university climbed even higher. But then what happened was Napoleon fell from grace. And when Napoleon fell from grace and got arrested and you know, the whole Malta Island thing, um, Lamarck, had fell too. And um, the university bureaucracy took away his position and uh, they let him teach, but he lost his chair. Um, he became, um, because of his association with Napoleon, he became sort of a black sheep and people weren't allowed to hang out with him. And uh, way back when, way back when in the day, professors were given housing by their universities. Can you imagine that? <laughs> be something. And um, they moved Lamarck into like the shittiest little cabin behind like where the greenskeepers left. And um, 
he died penniless and um, his family was left, left penal penniless because of his association with uh, Napoleon. Sad, but true story. But let's talk about Lamarck's science. What do we, what can we say about, why am I talking about Lamarck here? So, <coughs> um, Lamarck is, I'm gonna talk about some things that he got right. And I, I, I think that um, Lamarck has been vilified by history. And certainly he was vilified by the end of his life. And I think probably the reason that he's been vilified in history has to do more with his association with Napoleon than with his actual, what he actually got wrong. Um, okay, I keep wanting to talk about the drafts, but I'm gonna hold off on the drafts for a minute. There, there's some drama with the drafts. Okay, but let's talk about the things he got right. He is the guy who gave us these terms vertebrate and invertebrate. They had exi they, they didn't exist. He made them up. Things that have a backbone, things that don't have a backbone, because he's already thinking about like dichotomous keys. And he's thinking, and he's spending a lot of time looking at bugs and insects and small things that are close to the ground. So that's pretty cool. You know, we have vertebrate biology, invertebrate biology. We decide who gets protection in, as lab animals based on whether they're vertebrates or invertebrates. So Lamarck is the guy who's sort of, he's modernizing biology, which is funny that I should say that because he's also the guy who popularized the term biology. Before Lamarck was teaching, nobody used the word. Um, he did not invent this word. It was invented by monks. Um, but he was a avid reader of all that old stuff. And so he ran across the word biology, which means the study of life. And he's like, ah, that's what we do. And so um, his idea of biology is one of the first amongst Europeans to sort of move beyond natural history, which Euro uh, England gets stuck in the natural history. All things are made to praise God thing for you know, another hundred years. But um, France and some of the other European countries are starting to move beyond that. And so Lamarck gives us this word biology that we're still using today. He understood that if species didn't use organs, they would lose them. So while Lamarck was um, a working scientist, somebody discovered cave fish and cavefish are pretty stunning because they have eye sockets, but no eyeballs. They also live in dark caves. They don't need eyeballs. And so he's like, ah, they don't need eyeballs. So they don't use eyeballs. And so they use their, he probably didn't say it like this, but what he would have meant to say would have been something along the lines of the fish don't need that metabolic energy. They don't, if they invest their metabolic energy into growing eyeballs and maintaining eyeballs, they're wasting that metabolic eye energy because you don't need eyeballs. And so they should be using that energy for more armor, for growing faster, for producing more eggs, something like that. But he was really, he understood, he understood, and this is a pretty subtle, um, subtle approach to evolutionary biology. Um, usually we talk about adaptations, gaining adaptations. Well, he's talking about losing a specialization, um, which is part of, of natural selection. He's not wrong about this and it's important. And he was also right about this. He proposed this idea that you could gain a trait or you could lose a trait. And once you had a new trait, like horns, or you lost a trait, bye-bye eyes, that your babies would either have the horns or would be lacking eyes. So he understood that a trait, once an individual had it, could be passed down, which is really critical. He just got one small thing wrong. We're gonna circle back to that, but, but look at all of the things that he got right that we still use today. And explain to me why we think Lamarck is a dumbass. Okay, maybe you're like, I never even heard of Lamarck before today. Well, I'll circle back to the thing. So he published this idea in 1801 
And it was so heretical that the church made him unpublish it, retract it. And then he did because he was a political animal as most of us are. And um, he then republished it in 1809 because after eight years of lecturing on this topic, he became convinced that he was right. And what is this topic? This idea, the idea I'm talking about is this idea that the environment affects the shape and the organism, the organization of animals. So how animals look and how they organize themselves are going to be dependent on the kind of environment that they're in. This is the foundation for an entire field called behavioral ecology. And even though I told you that I was uh, an anthropologist, I specialized in behavioral ecology as a, as a graduate student. And so let's talk about how an environment might affect the shape of you. So true fact, um, do you guys know where gerbils are from? Anybody? Raise your hand. What? Nobody knows where gerbils are from? <laughs> They're from Israel. They're from the deserts of Israel, which is funny. So if you were to dissect the a dead gerbil, don't kill it for this because you could just Google image this. Um, if you look inside the nostrils of gerbils and other animals that live in the desert, instead of just having like tubes up to the back of your brain or the front of your brain, um, the nostrils of desert rodents are all convoluted and they're filled with all of these twisty, turny things. And the reason for that is because most of the time, most water loss isn't from sweating, it's from exhaling. All that water comes out, complete with coronavirus, um, which I don't think gerbils care about. So gerbils, to cope with living in the desert and water loss, they have these convoluted membranes in their nostrils so that they don't lose water. They can bring air in and out, but they don't, um, they don't lose water. Okay, that's an example of how an environment affects your shape. Desert rodent nostrils depend on whether or not you live in a desert. Okay, the same is going to be true for things like organization. Um, if we look at um, um, oh, whether a group is um, multi-male, multi-female, whether it's monogamous, whether it's um, polyandrous, um, all of that depends on the environment. Um, sometimes it depends on evolutionary history, but both of them play a role in how animals organize themselves. Are you going to be solitary? Under what conditions are you going to be solitary? Are you going to be group living? Um, under what conditions are you going to be group living? And so Lamarck was pretty sure that a lot of that depended, depended on the environment, which is a really sophisticated idea, right? We're getting into, we're getting into real biology and Lamarck nailed it. Okay. <laughs> this is kind of funny. These are the things that he got wrong. And they're just so subtle. He thought that you would get a trait, that you could acquire a trait because you needed it. So, for example, and this might seem like a stupid idea, but um, it's not exactly a stupid idea. Um, so, for example, when he first met giraffes, and people were like, okay, Lamarck, explain those next to the giraffes. Look, I'm finally getting to the giraffes. Lamarck said, wow, look at those, look at those necks on those giraffes. Clearly they have those long necks so that they can reach the high trees. And his story went along the line as the parents, that the parents got into a place where food was scarce except at the top of the trees. And so they reached and they reached and they reached and their necks got longer as they were reaching. And then they got longer necks because they needed them to eat the leaves on the top of the trees. And then they reproduced and they had babies with long necks. So reproducing and have babies with long necks is right. But the part about um, 
getting a long neck because you need it. Like you personally, I am the giraffe. I need a long neck. I'm going to get a long neck. That's not right. But he was looking at things. Where, where might that be right? Where could that be true? Well, what happens if you're a stevedore? Does anybody know what a stevedore is? <laughs> it's the guy who carries the luggage and the boxes on and off of um, ships and trains and stuff. You're a stevedore. Your job is to schlep heavy stuff on and off of, let's say, ships. What are you going to get as a stevedore? You're going to get big muscles. What do you need as a stevedore? Big muscles. And so people are acquiring a trait, big muscles, because they need big muscles to do their job. And what he wasn't taking into account was this idea we call, it's a terrible name, I'm sorry, but it's called phenotypic, which means the way you look plasticity, which means flexibility changing. So for instance, things that are phenotypically plastic, the color of your skin, you're like, no, Pachran, I'm white. No, Pachran, I'm black. <laughs> yeah, you are white or black or brown or whatever color you are, but I guarantee you that the color you are in January is different than the color you are in June, right? Because skin color is plastic. If you're outside in the summer, you were going to get tanner. Doesn't matter what your base color is. And uh, in January, when we're all stuck indoors, we all start looking like the background of that Lamarck picture there. Um, how much muscle you have, how fat you are, how thin you are, all of those are plastic. And you can see that they do change um, uh, in response to need, M maybe not skin color, but how muscly you are how fast you are. You're like, oh no, I've got to set speed. Well, you probably could be faster if you trained harder. Um, you know, especially if you're like me and you like never running for speed anyway. If I trained to run faster, I'd probably get faster. Um, so he, he was missing this point. The thing that he got wrong is that he thought you could acquire a trait at will or because of need. He didn't realize that you had to acquire a trait from your parents. And you can see his point, right? Because where would the parents get the trait? Uh, that was the, that's the question. And since the parents are looking at, like, that's a ridiculous question. So he's like, yeah. Mm. Um, so this, this necklace, this, this, um, this, this thing right here is a necklace put up by um, PETA, the people for the ethical treatment of animals. And it is uh, a necklace made of mouse tails and rat tails to represent the mice and the rats killed in science experiments, which is a pretty dark necklace, but that's the history of that. But Lamarck was so sure um, that once you had a trait or lost a trait, your kids would be that way, that he tried an experiment in his house where he um, got a bunch of mice and bred them and he kept chopping off their tails. So he'd get a mom mouse and a dad mouse and chop off its tail and then let them have babies. What do you think his hypothesis was? His hypothesis was that the next generation would have no tails. He did that for 22 generations. Do you know what happened? They all grew tails because his hypothesis was a little bit wrong. It's a tiny, tiny bit wrong. So we call, we call Lamarck, the thing that Lamarck is most most famous for is this idea of um, inheritance of acquired characteristics. So Lamarck went, goes down in history for this idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics. We're gonna come back to Lamarck um, with another video because even though Lamarck was wrong about, like he was missing the whole where a trait came from thing, he was so close to being right. And it turns out that sometimes traits change based on the environment in ways that are heritable. Heritable, heritable, I'm going with heritable there. Okay, so mostly the mark was wrong, um, but keep in mind, there is a case in which Lamarck is right. And we'll come back to that in a future video. See you guys later. Thank <laughs> you.